our glory and our uniqueness and why we are as we are is because we are a plant-animal symbiotic species. Our ordinary state, our state of nature, the way in which we existed until 10,000 years ago, was in a very tightly bound symbiotic relationship with plants. They were, uh, we domesticated them and we uh, spread them and, and we created environments for them through the use of burning. And in return for this, this mysterious connection opened up where real information couched in humanly cognizable terms, information about where the reindeer went, who you should marry, what the weather's going to do, stuff like that, real information began to be traded back and forth. Now, biologists are familiar with the notion of pheromones, message-bearing chemicals that regulate behavior within a species. But we're just getting ready to go to the next level and recognize the possibility of what have been called exopheromones, pheromones that regulate behavior between species. And it's very clear that, you know, in climaxed ecosystems of great age, such as the equatorial tropics of this planet, uh, exopheromonal interactions become the major mediating force in all the evolutionary exchanges going on. The old notion of competition and survival of the fittest is now seen to be bankrupt. The way nature works is it's the species that can make itself most necessary to other species. The one that can cut energy deals with the most of its neighbors that is the successful one. So you maximize cooperation, you maximize dependency, you maximize integration. This is the successful evolutionary strategy. I mean, of course you can be a jaguar and crash around in the forest and eat things immediately smaller than you, but um, jaguars will be a memory in the fossil record of this planet when the plants will still exist, given you know, that man were not part of the picture. So, uh, uh, the, the dynamic of... Uh, of life dictates that these uh, that these energy levels be held very close. Is that outside of the natural? Or, you know, well, no. I think you know nothing is outside of the natural, but uh, all of this can be explained uh, in terms of climatological flux on the African continent. Uh, very briefly, um, you know, the primates evolved in Africa. Out of the primates came the hominids, which were these gray seal, upright, uh, opposable thumb, binocular vision. And there were a number of these, and they existed for, you know, over the past six million years. But Africa and the planet, because of repeated glaciation, is subject to cycles of drying. And uh, every time the ice moved south, primate populations were bottled up in Africa. And we know there have been four glaciations immediately. The last one, the ice melted 20,000 years ago. And out of Africa, that last time, came pastoralists, people who had domesticated cattle and had a style of following cattle around rather than being just strictly hunter-gatherers. Well, I maintain what happened was... Uh, uh, these arboreal, tree-canopy living apes came under pressure as the continent dried up to expand their diet because the forests were disappearing and being replaced by grassland. Well, most animal species eat only one or two kinds of food. This is a general rule in nature, and it's in order to hold down exposure to mutagenic influence. But when an animal population is in a situation of food scarcity, the logical thing to do is to begin to test food sources and to expand your repertoire of food. Well, that's what these primates coming out of the trees did. Number one, they began eating meat, 
which gave them a real interest that they had never had before in these ungulate mammals that were evolving in the grasslands. And they began to test all kinds of other foods in the environment. Well, when you do that, you are exposing your population to mutation. <clears throat> and mutation rates soar. And it was during this period that uh, the human brain size doubled in like a, a million and a half years. <clears throat> Someone said it was the, um, the most rapid evolutionary expansion of a major organ ever seen in the fossil record. Nothing like it ever happened. Why? What was making this happen? Well, uh, it looks like probably huge numbers of mutations were taking place in this population because people were literally eating anything they could get their hands on. And in this environment of the grasslands, the mushrooms were growing on the dung of these ungulate animals. I mean, I think we had something, an unimaginably precious gift. We had consciousness and dynamic order. Consciousness as we experience it now within the confines of history is most analogous to cancer. I mean, it's just, you know, replicating, spreading. But it once was a dynamic, ordered thing. People lived, they died, they made love, they had children, they herded their flocks, they had ecstatic flights into dimensions which we cannot even conceive of, and they felt no need, you know, to break into the earth, to divert the rivers, to do all of this stuff. You know, l nature is just an ongoing story. The very drying processes that created those grasslands, that created those pressures on diet, that created that mother goddess religion, that evolved those ungulate animals, that process continued. And the grasslands dried up. And the winds began to blow and the water holes got further and further apart from each other, and the mushroom festivals went from every Saturday night to the first uh, Saturday of every month, and then to four times a year, and then to once a year, and then to once every five years, and then to never. And in the absence of the psychedelic experience, this ego thing gets going. You know, and you no longer see things on a planetary scale or a millennial scale. Or it's just about you know my women, my money, my land, my children, all of this stuff. And at that point, you get um, the appearance of of historical civilizations. You have kingship, kingship. You know, the age of Gilgamesh. I mean, my God, when you read the story of Gilgamesh, you just wonder what's going on. Uh, Gilgamesh spurned the goddess, and the goddess sent a bull, which to me is, you know, symbolic of the mystery of the mushroom, the ungulate herding horned animal, the crypto symbol for the god. The goddess sends a bull, and he, he uh, rejects the bull. He rejects the goddess, he rejects the bull. Then he takes Enkidu, the shaman figure, and forces him to go with him into the wilderness. And what do they do in the wilderness? This oldest of all myths, this story of the first men, what do they do? They cut down the tree of life. That's what they do. They cut down the tree of life. And then they, you know, it goes forward. The earliest strata of mythology that comes out of these Middle Eastern civilizations is full of this male-female nature artificial tension. The story of Genesis is a similar thing. I mean, what's happening in Genesis is history's first drug bust. Uh, a woman is involved with a plant and the plant uh, opens their eyes and they see that they are naked, which happens to be the case. They are naked. So in other words, they, they see, they grok their true existential condition. And Yahweh, wandering around mumbling to himself in the garden, says, this thing that these people have done, what if they eat 
of the fruit of the tree of life, then they will be as we are. So it's very clear that there is concern to withhold knowledge that hum, human beings are to be held in an inferior position. Otherwise, if they were to eat of the fruit of the tree of life, of knowledge, they would be as we are. So there's this whole tension. And in the story in Genesis, you'll recall Adam and Eve are cast out of Eden, and an angel is set at the east of Eden with a burning sword. Well, what I take this to be about is the... It's a story from a strata where already the shift to the dominator culture has taken place. But they're looking backward at the partnership society in, on the grasslands of Africa. And the, and the angel with the burning sword is nothing more than the sun that they literally were cast out of Eden. Eden disappeared around them. It dried up and blew away. And there was nowhere to go but the Nile Valley and Palestine. And these people who appear in the Nile Valley and Palestine at about 9,800 BC, called Natufayan, come out of nowhere with a very high culture and a tremendous ability to exploit plant resources. And I think they are the remnants of this partnership culture. And you see, our, our, the way in which all this ties into the present and tr- attempts to be more than just a, uh, you know, a kind of cultural reconstruction of prehistory is we're trying to understand who we are, why we are the way we are. We are very, very restless. And the path of our restless, frantic peregrinations across the intellectual landscape is what we call history, you know? It's our effort to try and get straight, get back to something which we feel we deserve and that we lost, and that we don't know quite what it was. Well, meanwhile, In the rainforests, in the Arctic tundra, these little brown people have been keeping the gnosis going, never questioning, never doubting, millennia after millennia, going into these hyperdimensional mind spaces and operating there. 